Our scripture this morning comes from the last book of the Old Testament and the first of the new. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, and in every place incense is offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Have we not one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our ancestors? And from the book of Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them following the resurrection. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. that she had been coping with me all weekend. <laughs> I hope it hadn't been too difficult, Cindy. <laughs> Christine and I have had a wonderful time in Omaha. I think this is our fifth visit to this very special city. I think of Omaha as being famous for three things. One is you host the College World Series. Second is you're the home of Warren Buffett. And thirdly, you have Countryside Church. And, and I want to tell you, this church is known across this country. And I think your music is wonderful. Thank you for that. I didn't know I'd hear Good King Wenceslas in April, but uh, I enjoyed it enormously. <laughs> and you have Eric Elness, whom I've known for a long, long time, whom I call the ecclesiastical version of Warren Buffett. I think you need to recognize that you have one of the very superior clergy in the whole United States. And his His career has been incredible. I've known him before he walked across the country. I've known him in Arizona. I've watched him grapple with, with issues in the common arena. I've watched the Arizona newspapers refer to him as a leadership figure. And I think it's just incredible that this special city of Omaha has attracted him to live and work in its midst and at this very special congregation. So I hope you feel a sense of being very, very important to many people beyond the boundaries of Nebraska. I'd like to talk about God this morning as a changing reality. That always upsets some people because their idea of God is that God is the ultimate truth, the ultimate unchanging reality. So the idea that God might be changing becomes rather difficult to embrace. And yet there's no human mind that can encompass the totality and the mystery of God. So any human understanding of God is always going to be in flux. It's always going to be changing. It's not so much that God is changing, but the human perception of God is always changing. It is never static. And any time anyone thinks that they have finally captured the ultimate meaning of God, they always seem to turn and begin to persecute anybody that doesn't agree with them. That's a very strange way to serve this ultimate God of truth. If you study the anthropologists who look at the whole history of the human endeavor, they're able to tell you how the human concept of God has changed dramatically through history. In the hunter-gatherer phase of our human existence, 
The overwhelming religion of human beings was what, was what we call animism. It was a spirit-filled world. Everything that lived and everything that moved had a spirit in it. And your religion was to try to keep the spirits happy so that the ocean stayed within its bounds and the rivers did not flood and the trees bore proper amounts of fruit and they had all sorts of rituals designed to enable that to continue to happen. But we didn't remain hunter-gatherers forever. We began to develop agricultural communities. Every school child knows that we started civilization in places like the Fertile Crescent between the Tigris and the Euphrates River in what is now Iraq and in the Nile River Basin where agricultural communities began to develop and where people no longer were wandering through the vast space looking for food every day. They were growing their own. And our idea of God shifted. And God suddenly became identified with the fertility process of the earth. Mother Earth became one of our understandings of God. It was the only time in human history when God was actually feminine. The reproductive processes of the, of the earth were seen as the manifestations of God. And we lived in that kind of religion until the communities got so complex that we had to develop military skills to protect them. And then the power shifted back toward males. And the tribal chief who, who governed and presided over and made order out of the chaos of the community became the analogy by which we began to think about God. Early religion is filled with tribal chieftains who are said to be sons of God. The divine right of kings actually comes out of that tribal mentality. And God was thought of as the militarily superior, all-powerful chief above the sky. But every people had their own God. And very slowly, over hundreds of years, centuries, the tribal chieftain God began to grow and emerge until people began to embrace the possibility that God was one. And monotheism became the idea of God that most human beings held. Well, we haven't reached as a, as a human family any sense of the oneness of God yet. But what we have reached is three great families of faith, the Judeo-Christian family in the West, the Islamic family of faith in the Middle East, and the Hindu-Buddhist understanding of God in the Far East. All of them are monotheistic religions, but each of those three monotheistic religions thinks that their understanding of God is the only true understanding. So we haven't quite reached human unanimity yet. It's surprising to a lot of people to realize that the Bible reveals a changing God, a growing God. The Bible opens in what we would call the tribal phase of human religion. The God of the early pages of the Bible is the tribal God of the Hebrew people. And the tribal God of the Hebrew people has all of the manifestations of tribal religion everywhere. Every tribal God has a chosen people. And the only trouble with being the chosen people is that as long as you think that you and your people are God's only chosen people, then anybody who's not part of your tribe becomes God's unchosen people. And then God's rejected. And then you can justify almost anything you want to do to your enemies because God has already rejected them. Tribal religion is filled with great difficulties. A second thing about tribal religion, and we find this in the Bible, is that the tribal God always hates everybody that the tribe hates that are the chosen people. And so if you open the Bible and begin to read it, like in the book of Exodus, you'll discover that God really doesn't like Egyptians. So God turns the Nile River into blood. And that kills all the fish. And the frogs come out and they take over the land. And then people break out in boils. And then the cows get mad cow disease, first instance of mad cow disease in human history. And then there are hailstones. And then there's darkness. And, and there are lice, not lice, but 
locusts and all sorts of things that plagued the Egyptians, not the Hebrews. They're immune. The Egyptians have to absorb all these plagues. And then the final plague described in the book of Exodus is that God dispatches the angel of death to go through all the land of Egypt and to kill, let me be emotional, to murder the firstborn male in every Egyptian household. Raise your hands, those of you who are firstborn males in your household, so you'll listen to this story existentially. <laughs> That's when the Jewish people learned to put the blood of the Paschal Lamb on the doorpost of their homes so the angel of death would pass over Jewish homes and only kill Egyptians. And that's where the word Passover comes from. So God really didn't like Egyptians. And then you remember the Red Sea story. And if you haven't read the Bible, you've all seen Cecil B. DeMille's dreadful movie called The Ten Commandments <laughs> that regularly plays during Lent and sets the, the task of biblical scholarship back another hundred years every time they play it on. <laughs> but you all know the story of how God parts the waters of the Red Sea so the Hebrew children can go through safely. And then God causes those rivers to come back to drown all the Egyptians. And then God is portrayed as on the other side of the Red Sea, rejoicing at the death of the Egyptians. Well, that's a pretty tough view of God if you happen to be an Egyptian. But of course, we don't read the Bible from an Egyptian perspective. That's tribal God activity, hating the enemies of the chosen people. And that's not where it stops. If you keep reading the Bible, you come to the story of Joshua, who succeeded Moses. And Joshua is at war with the people of Ammon, the Ammonites. And Joshua is winning the war, winning the battle. And the army of the Ammonites are in full flight, but the sun begins to go down. And so Joshua prays to God, and God stops the sun in the sky, says this biblical story. So Joshua will have more daylight to kill more Amorites. That's a strange reason to institute daylight saving time. <laughs> but God clearly doesn't like Amorites. And then if you keep reading the story, you'll come to the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel, where you discover that the prophet Samuel goes to the king, whose name is Saul, and orders him in the name of God to go to war against the people of Amalek, the Amalekites. And in that war, God's prophet says, you are to kill every man, every woman, every child, every suckling, every ox, and every ass among the Amalekites. That's in the Bible. God orders genocide against the Amalekites because they are the enemies of the chosen people. That is tribal religion. That's where when people begin to say to me that every verse of the Bible is the literal word of God, I think they must never have read it. So you have this attitude. God hates everybody the chosen people people hate. But the Bible changes. By the time you get to the passage that Eric read this morning from the book of Malachi, there's a very different understanding of God that has developed. The prophet has God saying, have we not one father? Has not God created us all? And the prophet says, from the rising of the sun to its setting, God's name shall be great among the Gentiles, among the Egyptians and the Amorites and the Amalekites. God's name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every nation incense shall be offered unto God's name. And then if you keep reading this biblical story, you come to the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, Folks, if you really understand God, you're going to have to love your enemies. You're going to have to bless those who persecute you. 
Now, that's all in one book. From sending plagues upon the Egyptians, to stopping the sun so you have more daylight to kill more of your enemies, to ordering genocide against the Amalekites, to saying that if you really understand God, you're going to have to love your enemies. That's quite a range. Even in the Bible, our understanding of God seems constantly to be shifting, constantly growing, constantly changing. What do you suppose brought about the change? How did we get from hating the Egyptians to loving your enemies all in one book? But what happened is that the Jewish nation produced a group of people that you and I call prophets. And we've totally misunderstood the prophets. We think of the prophets as people who predict the future. For those of you who are over 65, the prophets are sort of an ecclesiastical Walter Winchell. <laughs> See, you only laugh if you're over 65. <laughs> or an ecclesiastical Jane Dixon. That might get a little lower crowd. The prophets were not people who were predicting the future. The prophets were people who were discerning a new understanding of God. And the message of the Bible has to flow through those prophets before it can get from hating your enemies to loving your enemies. Now, there's 16 books of the prophets in the Bible. Uh, I don't have time to treat all 16. So I'm going to drop the top four because those are the ones that people know something about. I'm going to drop Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. They're called the major prophets. And then there's 12 books at the end of the, New Test of the Old Testament that the church calls minor prophets. I doubt if any of you have read any of them recently. I don't know about members of this tradition, but Episcopalians wouldn't be able to find them in the Bible, even if they wanted to. <laughs> but in this book of 12 that are called the Minor Prophets, I think you have the transition that helps us to know how we got from God hating the Egyptians to God compelling us to love our enemies. And I don't even have time to treat all 12. And some of them aren't really worth treating. If you've never read the book of Nahum, or the book of Obadiah, or the book of Habakkuk, you haven't really missed much. <laughs> Most of them are, are kind of rants against the, the hard facts of their life. But there are some jewels in that book of 12. So let me lift just four of them up for just a moment. The first prophet in the book of 12 is called Hosea. He was a remarkable man. He was an older man when he married a younger woman whose name was Gomer, not to be confused with Gomer Pyle. And Gomer was the town beauty. She was the sort of high school sweetheart. <clears throat> she was the life of the party. And she was a good bit younger than Hosea, who was a bit staid and a bit boring. And so people gossiped about this pending marriage. They wondered how it would work out. But Hosea was very proud of his young and beautiful wife. And so they joined as part of the jet set of Jewish society, the party people, the life of the party people. And they began a very fast-paced life. But as life went on, Hosea got to the place where he didn't want to go out every night. He didn't want to go out every weekend. He wanted to come home before Gomer was ready to come home from the party. And so they had to work out all sorts of compromises to keep the marriage intact. And after a while, Hosea would come home early, and his wife would come home with her friends. Then after a while, Hosea wouldn't go out at all, and his wife would go out with her friends and come back with her friends. And that was very dangerous in that patriarchal world. But eventually, as almost was inevitable, 
The day came when she went out and she did not come in and she disappeared. And Hosea searched for her and he couldn't find her as if she fell off the earth. And she began her life as sort of the favorite plaything of the jet set of Jewish society. And they played with her until they got tired of her and looked for a younger model. That happens in life. People don't think it will, but that inevitable day comes when you discover crow's feet around the edges of your eyes. And you notice that you're beginning to sag in places you have never sagged before. And you're no longer the darling of the fast set. And so Gomer began her descent. From being the favorite plaything of the jet set, she became the favorite plaything of anybody who wanted a plaything. And then when they tired of her, she became a prostitute. But even a prostitute has got to be able to attract customers. And when she could no longer attract customers, she became a slave. And the story of Hosea shows that this prophet still loving his wife, even though she had been gone for a long period of time, searched for her. And because he knew the ways of his world, he searched for her in the slave markets. And finally one day, the slave master brought this haggard, bloodshot, tangled haired woman up on the block and offered her for sale. And the riffraff set up a howl about who would ever pay anything for that battered old bag. But Hosea recognized this woman as his wife, Gomer. And so over the den of the crowd, he collared 15 pieces of silver, an astonishing price, the price one would pay for a strong young male servant. And then the riffraff turned on Hosea to see who had offered this incredibly stupid thing. And the catcalls began to rain down upon him as he walked forward, paid the price, took Gomer by the hand, and took her back to his home and installed her in that home, not as his slave, but as his wife and as the mistress of the household. And Hosea learned something from that experience. He learned that even when Israel goes, in Hosea's words, whoring after false gods, that God still loves God's people, just as Hosea still loved his wife, Gomer. And suddenly, in the writings of Hosea, God was transformed. And God became identified with love. And the tribal God began to fade. And love began to be the primary connotation of the divine. And then there was Amos. Amos was a shepherd, the keeper of sycamore trees. He would be known as sort of a country bumpkin. I picture him in bibbed overalls, a straw hat, a corncob pipe, a wide space between his teeth, and speaking with a country twang. I grew up in the South, and I know what people think about country twangs. But something burned within Amos because he saw in his people a terrible interest in religion but no interest in doing anything for the poor. He wondered how you could worship God and ignore the poor. And so this country bumpkin from the south, from the village of Tekoa, goes to the shrine of the king in the chapel called Bethel. And he gets the attention of the crowd, and he begins to tell them that worship that doesn't flow into justice is idolatry. The message of Amos, if you could sum it up in one word, one line, would be that worship is nothing but human justice being offered to God, and human justice is nothing but divine worship being lived out. And if you ever separate worship from justice, you've turned God into an idol. And so as the message of the Jewish tradition flowed through Hosea, God got redefined as love, and then it flowed through Amos, and God got redefined as justice. 
And then it flowed through a little prophet named Jonah. Everybody knows Jonah, though there's no whale in that story. There's only a great fish that God creates to be part of the drama. It's a once upon a time story. No, nobody ever meant that story to be taken literally. But it's a story about prejudice. The sin of Jonah was that Jonah believed that God could not love beyond Jonah's ability to love. So when God asked Jonah to go preach to the Ninevites, Jonah responded, God, how can you possibly love those unclean Gentiles? Since I don't love them, how can you love them? And the story is the drama about how Jonah comes to a new understanding. It's a powerful story. It's a story about prejudice. And what is prejudice? Prejudice is when you or I think that the love of God is bounded by the limits on our ability to love someone who is different. And the last one I will mention is Malachi. That's not even his name. That's simply a Jewish word which means my messenger. The present prime minister of Iraq is named Maleki. That's nothing but Malachi. It's a word that means my messenger. He's a nameless person. But in Malachi, the last book of the Hebrew Scriptures, as we Christians organize those Scriptures, Malachi is the prophet in whom tribal religion finally breaks the boundary and flows into a universal concept. The tribal God always was only concerned about the people of the tribe. When you get to Malachi, God becomes concerned about all the people of the world in all of their differences. That's why Malachi can write, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us all? And Malachi can say, from the rising of the sun to its setting that takes in the whole world, God's name ultimately shall be great among the Gentiles, the unclean people of the world. And in every nation, incense shall be offered unto God's name. It's because the biblical faith flowed from being a tribal deity through these prophetic voices that it made it possible for Jesus of Nazareth to emerge out of that Hebrew nation and to expand the understanding of God to include even our enemies. You must love your enemies. You must bless those who persecute you. Does that make you a good person? No, it makes you a whole person. Because until you are able to love your enemies, you cannot possibly be fully human. Now, do you think that's easy? Talk to Jewish people who lost loved ones in the Holocaust of Nazi Germany. And tell them that the Christian religion says you will not be whole until you can love Adolf Hitler. You think that's easy? Talk to people who had relatives that were killed in the attack on the World Trade Center on September 9th, September 11th, 2001. And say to them, your faith will not be whole until you can bring yourself to love Osama bin Laden. You think that's easy? Talk to people in Nebraska and say, you can't be whole until you learn to love the people of Oklahoma. <laughs> then it gets personal. And if you get into one of these states that has two primary football powers, like Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, you'll find the state is even more divided. I lived in Virginia for a long time, and rivalries are between the University of Virginia and Virginia Tech. And the stories were wonderful. Do you know why they have artificial turf on the football field at Virginia Tech, says a Virginia alumnus? It's because the homecoming queen ate all the grass. 
it's hard to bring yourself to love those that you have described as your enemies or your competitors. And yet the fact is that as long as I try to put somebody else down, I am not a whole human being. And what the Christian faith is about more than anything else is calling us not to be religious, but to be whole, to be free, to be able to love those beyond the boundaries of our ability to love, to be made a whole human being. That's what the Christian story is about. That's what the changing story of the Bible leads us to conclude. And maybe it's best summed up by the fourth gospel, who after trying to communicate the story of Jesus, has Jesus say, I have come for one purpose only, not to make you religious. God knows we've got enough religion in our world today, and some of it is quite destructive. Now, Jesus didn't come to make us religious. He didn't come to make us moral or righteous either. Moral and righteous people know a great deal about judgment, but they know almost nothing about love. And he didn't come so that we would have the true faith. We'd be the orthodox believers. Everybody disagreed with us would be wrong. My experience with people who believe that they finally got the true faith is that they always start shooting at anybody that disagrees with them. No, the message of Jesus is the message that flows through the prophets till we can embrace all that God has made. I have come, says Jesus in the fourth gospel, that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. When you and I come to a full acceptance of the humanity that is our own, then we're able to give our lives away to others. Then we don't have to build ourselves up by tearing somebody else down. Then we don't have to have an enemy. We don't have to have a rival. The call of the Christian faith is a call into a new kind of freedom. The freedom to be all that each of us was created to be. And that's finally where the God of the Bible would lead us to understand as the divine purpose. Amen.